The following program is brought to you by Caltech. So thanks for coming, everybody. I don't think this is amplifying me. It's just recording me. But uh, it's my enormous pleasure to be here to introduce Jamie Bach today to tell us what I think most of us will agree is the most exciting result in cosmology so far in this century, the 21st century, not maybe the last 100 years, but the 21st century, this is, this is very exciting. Jamie uh, is officially a Caltech professor since 2012, but he's been here for a lot longer than that. Uh, he arrived, I think, almost right out of grad school. He arrived at JPL in 1994, and uh, has been visiting faculty at Caltech ever since, and is part of the very strong collaborative group between astronomy at Caltech and, and JPL as well. And there was a, this beautiful, of course, you all know, beautiful press conference and technical talk on Monday at my alma mater, Harvard Smithsonian CFA. But I hope we all recognize that the origin of the BICEP2 experiment was at Caltech and JPL. In particular, it was at the tennis courts across the street from Cahill, where Jamie and Brian Keating uh, would play tennis and then talk about how to build a polarization experiment to look at one degree angular scales on the sky, never thinking they would see anything interesting, but you know, hoping, you know, this is what you do, you, you know, you do the experiments. And I'll leave all the technical details up to Jamie. The one sort of piece of context I wanna add is that Last week, and in all the weeks before last week, I would go around giving popular talks about cosmology, and I would brag about the fact that we have experimental data, empirical information about what the universe was doing one second after the Big Bang. In a 14 billion year old universe, that's very, very impressive, one second after the Big Bang. As of Monday, I need to update all of my slides. <laughs> we now have empirical information, real data, that tells us what the universe was doing one trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. To tell us how we got that, please welcome Jamie Bach. Thank you, Sean, for that fine introduction. Um, the results I'm going to present today are the work of a great team. And um, it's the product of the contributions, the inspiration, the genius, the determination, and plain hard work of over 50 people. <clears throat> and these 50 people had a single scientific goal in mind, to make the deepest search possible for a polarization signal from inflation. <clears throat> Um, this is really the greatest group of individuals I've worked with. And so um, as a member of the team, it's my um, profound honor here to present these results to you today. <clears throat> I should also uh, mention the contributions of Andrew Lang, who is one of the founders of this program. Um, Andrew was a, a profound guy. And the years in graduate school um, and just after graduate school are when we scientists um, really figure out how to do science and answer the question of what it means to be a scientist. Um, and this is a deep question, and there's no simple answer. Uh, it's a matter of philosophy and um, inspiration, and it's about how we question the universe, and it defines who we are as scientists. And Andrew had such a profound influence on so many people at this stage in their careers. Uh, and, and it really just goes right through to the, the, the whole of the collaboration. Um, Andrew was also uh, not afraid to take risks. He was a pioneer, and he would uh, boldly go into ventures without knowing the answer. He fondly referred to this enterprise as a wild goose chase, and uh, would show slides like this, in, including slides to um, scientific advisory committees. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was too serious to show such a slide in my talk, but yet I spent uh, many years of my life chasing this goose. <clears throat> okay, the team itself um, ha has four lead institutions, uh, and they're Caltech, uh, Harvard, which is led by John Kovac, uh, University of Minnesota, which is Clem Pryke, and Stanford uh, University by Chaolin Kuo. And you see some of the members of the collaboration here. We also have. Uh, key contributions from Brian Keating's group at the University of San Diego, uh, Lionel Dubond 
at uh, CEA in France, uh, Kent Irwin's group at NIST, Cardiff University in Wales, University of Toronto led by Bart Netterfield, and uh, the University of British Columbia uh, led by Mark Halpern. But I wanted to recognize uh, people on the team locally, and um, please don't be embarrassed and stand up. Uh, so here we have um, Jeff Filippini. Please stand. I, I insist. <laughs> Mar Martin Luker. Roger, Roger O'Brien. Zach Stanishevsky. Grant Tepley. Sunil Gawan. Darren Dow. Sorry. Uh, Sergi Hildebrandt. Hian Wen. Uh, Tony Turner. <clears throat> and I'd also like to acknowledge um, Pete Mason, Victor Hustoff. <laughs> okay. um, all right. So this would not be possible without the dedicated efforts. Uh, the other point I would like to make is this is really a program. Uh, the results that we presented were from BICEP2, but it's really the middle part of a, of a three-step program now turning into four steps. So this project started uh, at the tennis courts in 2001 uh, for a project that was really dedicated for going after this crazy goose, looking for degree scale polarization called BICEP1. Uh, and it has evolved through stages. In each stage, we've made the experiment more powerful so we can get the sensitivity. Uh, and the final stage right now is called the Keck Array, uh, or the, that's the current stage. And um, this is also the appropriate time to mention our sponsors. So <laughs> I would like to say that the operations and support for all this pro these programs come from the National Science Foundation, Office of Polar Programs, uh, who, who do all the great work at the poll in particular. Um, we've had generous institutional support from Caltech and JPL. In fact, this program started for a 200K director's discretionary fund between JPL and Caltech. And we've had great support from the JPL RTD program, uh, particularly on the detectors. The Robinson program helped start the original BICEP telescope. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation enabled the development of superconducting detectors here on campus. Uh, the John and Nell, Nellie Kilroy, they provided a generous fellowship for John Kovac. And um, finally, the WM Keck Foundation is, uh, has supported our current incarnation of the experiment. Okay, uh, this was the experience many of you had uh, on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sorry about that. So the, I, I can only just give you a, a taste of what the public demand was like. This is the, the hits on our dinky little website that had the, uh, the results in the papers and the band powers and things like that. Three, three and a half million hits, uh, which was really a, a site mostly for scientists. Um, <clears throat> But we did have a press conference. There's a little bit of it. It's now available. And uh, it was just a great experience. So you see the pictures going by here in the team and all the notables who uh, came, to, came for the event. Really wonderful. And you may have also seen this video, which has been Today, going on. Today, I'm going to deliver a news to Professor Andre Linde, who is the founding father of inflation. So inflation is the theory about the bang of Big Bang. It explains why we have all this stuff in the universe. So today I'm going to tell him our experiment, BICEP2, based at South Pole, has found the smoking gun evidence of inflation. He has no idea that I'm coming. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, hi. So I have a surprise for you. Wow. It's so five sigma at point two. Discovery. Yes. What? <laughs> Just a second. Can, 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 can you repeat it? Five sigma, as clear as day, are at point two. <laughs> Can you repeat it again? R, point 0.2 plus minus point point two? 0.05. We <laughs> <laughs> don't expect anybody, Irina, tells it's probably some kind of delivery. Did you order anything? <laughs> yeah, I ordered it 30 years ago. <laughs> Finally. Okay. 
Uh, about 12 of those two and a half million hits are mine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so just to review briefly the, the importance of inflation in modern cosmology. So up to about the 1980s, we knew that the universe is expanding from measurements up on Mount Wilson, from Edwin Hubble. Uh, from um, uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, we had worked out that at one point it was hot and dense, like the inside of the sun. And in um, the mid-60s, around about the time I was born, in fact, um, Penzias and Wilson detected this large signal from the cosmic microwave background. And so th these are the pillars of the hot Big Bang model. But yet there's one, was one um, troublesome problem. And, and just to give you uh, a, a taste of what I think one of the drivers here was, is if we look at the sky here in the optical, that's what it looks like. <clears throat> if you look at the sky in the millimeter, this is what it looks like. This is real data. And uh, this, so this is very troubling for uh, cosmologists in the, in the 80s because the temperature at every point on the sphere, everywhere we look, is the same to uh, 10 parts per million. And since the photons from these different regions are just reaching us today, there must be some sort of cosmic conspiracy that has these um, causally A-connected regions all being at exactly the same temperature. And so the solution for this problem and others was the theory of inflation, which posits that early in the universe, uh, the universe went through an exp uh, uh, explosive expansionary phase. And this uh, inflation took a, our, our visible universe and sprang from a subatomic volume, which was all in causal contact. And the rapid expansion flung that, those regions out of causal contact so that they're all at the same temperature. Uh, and when we look at the, the, those surfaces today, uh, even though uh, the photons are just reaching us, they remember that the, the initial conditions provided by, by inflation. So this was a remarkable theory at the time, and I suppose many people thought it would not be testable. <coughs> it, what inflation does uh, in terms of the, uh, the background is it actually expands tiny quantum fluctuations uh, to enormous scales. Okay, all the large scale structure we see in the universe once quantum fluctuations blown to these enormous sizes. And we've known that the density waves uh, that we see in the microwave background, and so this is a map of the microwave background uh, from, from Planck, the Planck satellite. We know that those density waves are, are on the sky. They drive temperature differences, and then that structure evolves to form the large-scale structure and galaxies and what we see in the universe today. But what we don't know, didn't know, is whether there might also be quantum fluctuations in gravity. And then the process of inflation would also expand those fluctuations to enormous scales, but they would come out as gravitational waves. And uh, the signal we're seeing here with bicep two are, are, are a signature of uh, such an effect. Okay, so the, the, the temperature anisotropies have been extremely well studied. And this plot here represents the state of the art in understanding the distribution of spatial power on the sky uh, in, in temperature anisotropy. So the, the data you see here in red were taken by the Planck spacecraft, which had a big role, by the way, from, from, from JPL. Uh, WMAP, uh, two, two ground-based telescopes called uh, ACT in Chile and the South Pole Telescope, which is our next door neighbor at the, at the South Pole. And uh, we see a multiple series of acoustic peaks that are largely the product of, of, of density waves. So um, how can we use the cosmic microwave background to explore these earlier times? So brief history of the universe is here after the Big Bang, this inflationary epoch occurs at 10 to the minus 30 something seconds after the Big Bang. The universe rapidly expands, inflation then stops, and the uh, uh, universe cools down with time, light elements are formed, the photons that comprise the microwave background are formed, but they strongly scatter on free electrons up until the time that by the expansion, the universe has cooled down so that you form neutral hydrogen. And once that happens, the universe becomes transparent to, to light and uh, those photons can free stream to us. And those are the photons we see today when we look at the microwave background. <clears throat> and inflation, as I said, amplifies uh, quantum fluctuations to large scales, and we know it creates density waves which stretch out over the time of the universe, 
uh, and perhaps some uh, amount of, of gravitational waves. But this, so the microwave background is a wonderful tool to study the early universe, but it's also something of a screen. We can't see past it in optical light. Uh, when we look at the surface of last scattering in the microwave background, it's like looking at the surface of a cloud. And photons, in the time reverse sense, are sca strongly scattered by electrons. <clears throat> so um, how can we use the microwave background to learn something about earlier times in the universe? Well, of course, the microwave background is transparent to gravitational waves, which are still presumably with us today. And those gravitational waves interact with the universe at the time of the microwave background, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And they imprint a, 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 a detectable signal which can best be distinguished um, in polarization. So this is an idea that was proposed uh, in the 90s. Uh, Mark Kamikowski was one of the people who propagated this theory when he was, uh, at, when he was at Caltech until recently. Uh, and so this became a goal uh, in the late 90s of the CMB community to go out, see if we could detect this signal. Yeah. Now, uh, seriously, uh, this I'm just is, um, curious, and I think a lot of us are. Uh, a, a theorist what do you angle seriously on, like on, to on read, like, just like means. in the book world? Fascinated with science. Really? Uh, fascinated with science. It's incredible. Have you heard this about was, the new uh, brain theory? Recommended to me by Andre Linda. Uh, uh, whose who's brain theory is this? It's, it's, it's Stephen, Stephen Hawking. Has been, uh, Stephen Hawking? Yeah, talking about this new brain theory about the universe and uh, opposed to the Big Bang theory, and they're, they're coming out with some new concepts. It's really exciting. And you actually the read erotic, about erotic uh, universe. Have you heard about this? The Ip, say it again. Ip I, 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 it's very difficult to say. <laughs> it, erotic universe. Wow, that's amazing yeah. that you're reading that. Well, stuff. the model, see, the model we have now, Conan, is based on the idea that our Big Bang universe was created from the collision of two three-dimensional worlds moving along a hidden extra dimension. But conceptually, the erotic <laughs> model is very different. There is no inflation or rapid change happening at all. The approach to collision takes place very slowly over an exceedingly long period of time. It's quite fascinating that the rapid change and very slow change can produce nearly the same effects. The difference <laughs> results in one distinctive observational prediction, though. The inflationary cosmology predicts a spectrum of gravitational waves that may be detectable in the cosmic microwave background. The epirotic model, however, predicts no gravitational waves effects should be observable in the cosmic microwave background. And I'm just so relieved by this. <laughs> because I've been... No, really. Incredible. I... I've... <laughs> Okay, uh, so we were looking for a very faint signal, very hard, hard to detect. So the CMB is, is faintly polarized. And uh, the signal that we're looking for, uh, this, this B mode signal, which I'll describe in a, a couple of words, that's a difference in the polarization state of light of about one part in 30 million from the, the temperature. So it was a very, very tiny, subtle effect. And uh, the, what sources polarization in the microwave background is that photons are scattering off of electrons, and scattering can naturally produce polarization. Um, but in order to produce a, a signal, you need to have a temperature difference, and this temperature difference has to be seen in the frame of a local electron at the time of this, this last scattering process. And in fact, it's not just any difference in temperature, it has to be a quadrupolar difference in temperature. So imagine here we're an electron sitting on a density wave as it's propagating by, and we're on the peak of the wave, and we see a difference in temperature along the, the wave propagation direction, maybe that it'll be hotter, and cold if we look out to the sides. <clears throat> so that temperature difference that the electron sees is then scattered and makes a small polarization signal. Okay, so th that was the example shown of a scalar wave and because of this temperature difference in the direction of the wave, the uh, polarization setup is either going to be perpendicular to or, or parallel to the propagation direction of the wave. And so you get a polarization pattern for a density wave that looks something like, like this, that this wave is going by. That's the kind of polarization pattern one would see. However, that's distinctly different from a gravitational wave. Gravitational wave, as it's propagating along, uh, sp space stretches in one direction and squeezes in another direction. And that sets up a temperature difference. So now if I'm the uh, electron sitting here on the crest of a gravitational wave, 
I'll see a quadrupolar pattern. Um, <clears throat> and that quadrupolar pattern is different than the pattern seen on a density wave. And so you get a polarization pattern that then has these sl slanty effects. So it'll be diagonal down, go to zero diagonal right. Okay, and this, this pattern is uh, called, a, called a B mode pattern. Now, a key thing about an E mode and a B mode pattern is that an E mode pattern, um, you can put it in a mirror and the pattern doesn't change sign, whereas a, a B mode pattern does. And so there's a, a, a deep symmetry property here that density fluctuations don't have a handedness. So they can't produce a polarization pattern with a handedness. So density fluctuations can only make an E mode type polarization pattern, whereas a, a gravitational wave can make a B mode pattern. In fact, it can also make an E mode pattern. Uh, so the detection of a B mode pattern is thus uh, indication of a gravitational wave. Okay, so we started this search um, and worked for a long time to try and detect something. Uh, this shows the state of the art upper limits on B mode polarization uh, circa, uh, I guess, January. Well, no, actually March, because of uh, po po polar bear. That's right, these just came out uh, a few days ago before our release. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the, this uh, y-axis is the amplitude of fluctuations. It's the amount of variance that you see. And the x-axis is multipole, so that's angular scale, where large angle, angular scales are on the left and fine angular scales are on the right. Uh, there is, uh, the dashed lines here are the uh, gravitational wave signal, which peak at an angular scale of about two degrees on the sky. The solid line is actually a cosmological weed. It's a gravitational distortion of the background E-mode pattern from the microwave background. Because as these microwave background photons propagate to us, they're propagating through the whole universe. And their path is slightly gravitationally perturbed by large scale structure. And, and that effect can make a, convert the a dominant E mode pattern into a B mode pattern, okay? Uh, and then finally, you'll notice that the, the, the amplitude here of the B mode pattern is not well known. In fact, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's where the wild goose uh, co comes in. <clears throat> and so we really didn't know how far we would have to drill down and just assumed we would be going down forever and forever. Uh, okay, uh, our experiment design was really to do one thing, it was really to look for this inflationary signal. Uh, we chose a design that had an angular resolution of about half a degree, which is just enough to see the inflationary gravitational wave signal, uh, but is not fine enough to see the polarization pattern at finer angular scales. So this is really a B modes or bust approach. We had one goal in mind, 50 people working on it. Uh, and the design here was a, a rather novel concept at the time. And that was to, to use a small telescope. Um, and uh, you know, it's only a 26 centimeter aperture with, with two lenses, but, but this telescope has enormous light gathering capability. It's got a huge field of view, 20 degree field of view. Uh, uh, the whole telescope is also cooled to four degrees uh, Kelvin. Um, so that we don't have to worry about emission from the telescope. And furthermore, it's completely surrounded by absorbing materials. Uh, it's a challenge, it'd be a challenge to take a big telescope and cool to four Kelvin. So that's, that's one of the advantages. Uh, right from the very beginning, we designed the, the optics so that we could put in new detectors into the focal plane, because those were coming along at the time. They weren't gonna be available for the first stage of the experiment. But the, the concept was always that when they were ready, they would just pop right into the, into the focal plane. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, we can take this whole system and spin it around its axis to take out any symmetry, uh, asymmetries in, in, in the optics itself. So that's another great advantage. Uh, and finally, the, the focal plane here, the telescope's cooled to four Kelvin and the focal plane is cooled to uh, 0.25 Kelvin to get the required sensitivity. On the left is a state-of-the-art focal plane in 2005. So this is what we initially built into our experiment. And uh, that was what, it's similar to the Planck focal plane that flew um, in, in space, actually used one generation of detectors later. This is about what we could do back then in 2005. 
And each of these detectors, in fact, each of the detectors in Planck, which is up in space, pretty much limited by photon noise from the microwave background. So if, in order to get the necessary sensitivity to detect the B-mode signal, uh, we needed to improve the sensitivity of the instrument, and the only way to do that was to build more detectors. Um, so building more detectors might remind you of, say, like um, going from the film in your camera to a, a CCD chip, uh, and, and you know how that's worked out. But actually the problem is much more difficult because we don't need to just make a lot of detectors. We have to make, uh, well, you know, each of these pixels here is really a system. It's uh, a concentrating, filtering, polarization, analyzing, detecting, amplification system, each of those pixels. And so somehow we have to take all that functionality and, 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 and mass, produce, ma mass produce it. So it's like mass producing your entire camera on a, on a chip. Uh, and so we, we came up with a pretty radical design here, which is that each of these pixels you see here is replaced by an entirely lithographed polarization sensor. Uh, and um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about it and read out with superconducting amplifiers. And so that took us from uh, a focal plane that looked like this on the sky to a focal plane that uh, would look like that. Uh, and there's an increase of detectors by about five. And actually, each of these detectors works about two times better. So the, the net gain was a factor of 10 in observing time. Um, so the, we didn't want to spend 30 years at the pole with BICEP-1, so we could do these observations in just three years. Uh, this is just another nice picture of the, the, the radical change going from this focal plane to a, a, a wafer here, which actually is two times more powerful than the entire focal plane. And the sensors are made um, at JPL's micro devices lab. Okay, the way they, the, they work is the, the front of these uh, devices is a, a printed antenna, basically. It's a superconducting antenna to have very low, uh, very low propagation loss. Uh, and, and this antenna, this is only a part of it, focuses the beam, it gathers the light, if you like. There's a filter which determines the passband. And there's two polarizations that are interleaved here, so you get both polarizations. And this is really, a, it's, 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 it's an entirely lithographed antenna, so at least in principle and with a fair wind, uh, one can make, make many of these things. And I'd like to say the initial ideas here actually came from Jonas Zemidzinus and Peter Day at JPL. Once light comes from the antenna, it propagates to a freestanding micro-machined little island. Okay, so this is made out of a film. Uh, you can see the size scale here, that's 100 microns. So light from the antenna propagates down to a resistor here and that resistor is where the power is dissipated and turned into heat. Uh, the island is thermally isolated on these dinky little micro-machined legs of silicon nitride. And that power then uh, heats up the island and is sensed with a superconducting transition edge thermometer. So here's the cartoon version of how that works. Um, and uh, uh, we're, uh, one of the things I like about this focal plane is we use many different properties of superconductivity to, to solve various seemingly uh, big problems um, with, with, with different properties. So we use superconductivity to get very low loss in the antenna. We use superconductivity in a different way to, to measure the, the heat. And then finally, we use quantum amplifiers based on another property of superconductivity to amplify 32 channels at a time um, multiplexed at uh, this temperature of 250 millikelvin. So that's the, that's the first part, that's the guts of the instrument. The, the second part was to go to the world's best observing site, and that, that would be the South Pole. This is a picture of what the pole looks like during the day. This is the airfield. Uh, this is the residence quarters where people live. And uh, this is the dark sector lab where the experiments are, our experiments over here, in fact. <clears throat> now the pole is uh, a great place for observing because it's well, it very, has very little water vapor in the atmosphere, so the atmosphere is very quiet. Um, another feature of the pole is that it's dark for six months uh, during the year and uh, gets even colder. And that means the atmosphere is also very stable because it's not churned over by diurnal variations you'll get at a mid-latitude site. Uh, so this is a, a, a not un a typical uh, night here with, with aurora that don't bother us. Uh, uh, but you can see here the plane of the galaxy, and 
we're worried about emission from the galaxy. So the other part of our strategy is to choose a region uh, in, in the galactic sky where we have the least foreground emission from the galaxy. And as it turns out, happily, there's a very, uh, really an excellent region, very low galactic foregrounds that's accessible from the pole. Uh, and so we call this region the Southern Hole. And uh, at 150 gigahertz, it's very clean of, of both polarized dust and synchrotron foregrounds. Uh, another factor at the pole uh, we call <coughs> relentless observing. Um, and that's because the sky simply just goes around and around all the time at the pole. And so we can observe um, our region relentlessly. <laughs> this is a time-lapse film that just shows what we do every day um, for, for, for years and years. Uh, <laughs> so here we're scanning back and forth in azimuth. And occasionally, you'll see the telescope stop and do a little L-nod, uh, which we use for calibration off the atmosphere. And then we go back and do some more. So here, we'll see if there's an L-nod. And back to work. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, after three years of, of fun like that, uh, this, this is what our uh, data set looks like. So, so first of all, you can see the uh, um, on-source time here in blue is very, very efficient. Um, this is the time when the instrument's up and running and observing. So typically about 80%. The high periods are during the, um, the winter. Uh, and and that's, that's the best observing time. These dips are during the, the summers. So during the summer, typically, we send people down. That's the only time when the pole's accessible. We send people down and we service the instrument. Occasionally, we'll have some summer observations, usually around Christmas. Uh, and then we go back make some improvements, uh, calibration, what have you, and, and go back and chug away again. So we, we did this for three years with, uh, with BICEP2. And you can see the sen instrument sensitivity. Uh, it's 15.8 microkelvin root seconds in, in years two and three. Uh, I think at the time that was a world's record. We made some changes, basically tuning up the instrument in the first year. And you can see after tuning up the instrument midway through the first year, we picked up a, a fair amount of sensitivity. And we just you know, accumulate sensitivity over time. And the final sensitivity in our map in a one degree patch is 87 nanokelvin. And the total sensitivity of the map is a little bit over three nanokelvin. So the data we have are the, the best polarized maps of their kind uh, in the world. Uh, so the next step is to go through and sort out what data uh, are usable for science observations. So we have a whole battery of, of cuts. Many of these cuts have to do with the weather. You can see the total efficiency there in red. Most of those are cuts for weather, but occasionally we'll have a problem with the instrument uh, or something like that. And here's what the maps look like. You should not be impressed because <laughs> The temperature anisotropies here are really super bright. So we see these temperature anisotropies all the time, every day. It's, they're practically used for calibration now. Uh, what, so this is the signal uh, we see here in temperature. Note the stretch is plus or minus 150 microkelvin. And on the right is a, a difference. So we call them jackknives, where we take one image of the sky accumulated in some fashion and another image and subtract them. They're designed to give approximately zero. We can use these to test how well the instrument's performing. So you see here in temperature, does a pretty good job, not perfect. The signal is very big. Here are the polarization maps. And these are maps done in Stokes Q and U, where Q is polarization that's vertical horizontal, and U is the, uh, this direction. So Q is this minus this, U is this minus this. And uh, the signal's smaller. This, these maps are about plus or minus uh, three microkelvin. And, uh, this is the Q map, and this is the U map, and this is a very high signal to noise map of polarization. And just by eye, you can see in, in the Q map, you kind of see this plus minus pattern in the map. And in the U map, you see this sort of chicken wire crossy pattern. And uh, that's actually a expected signature if the signal is dominated by this E mode polarization pattern. So just by eye, you can tell that's in fact the case. And then here are the differences, you know, at least visually signal's going away to zero like it should. So we can then make a map of that total polarization. 
you know, polarization is this headless ve vector map. And you'll notice that the, there's an appetization on this map from the way we combine the data. We filter out low modes. And uh, that, that filtering also distorts the structure a little bit. OK, but this, this is a, a, that map now rendered in polarization. You can see by eye again that this map is dominated by E-mode polarization. And the way to see that is if you look at a swirly region, well, sorry, a, a region of polarization and go along the gradient where the polarization is increasing or decreasing, the polarization vector will be orthogonal or parallel to the direction of the gradient. And that's the signature of an E-mode uh, polarization pattern. So the scale here on these lines is 1.7 microkelvin. Now, if I project out, we can mathematically decompose this polarization map to an E-mode map and a B-mode map. So now I'm going to show you what the B-mode map looks like from this decomposition. And that's the B-mode map. OK, so it's, it's pretty small. Uh, but it's, uh, so I have to turn up the scale. As I turn up the scale, now you can see the, the, the B-mode pattern. And the, the B-mode pattern, uh, you can tell it's a B-mode pattern because if you go from a region where the polarization is just changing the, along the gradient, that polarization vector is diagonal to the gradient direction of the increase. And that's the signature of a B-mode pattern. So this is about one-tenth of the total signal uh, in, in this B-mode pattern. And uh, h here I'm showing the same pattern but with the color stretch where the colors indicate uh, counterclockwise or clockwise uh, polarization in, in B modes, respectively. Okay, so you might wonder whether this is noise or, uh, uh, or real. Uh, so we do a full simulation. Our, our, our data analysis goes end to end where we can put in uh, uh, various cosmologies all the way through to, to observe it with the instrument, add noise, make a full, full simulation. Uh, so it, th this is a process of, of he shown here of taking a, a universe which does not have a gravitational wave signal and putting it through this entire pipeline. And this is our data, okay? But this also includes noise. And so just visually you can see from the, the maps that there's more structure uh, in, in this map of the sky than there is uh, from the simulation. Now, if I take the power spectrum of that map, here are, here are our data points. Uh, so once again, the inflationary gravitational wave signal is this dash line. That's a theory line. The solid line is the lensing signal. <clears throat> uh, and then the data points are the black points. And the data points are greatly in excess of a theory model which would not have a gravitational wave component, which would just be the solid line. So you can see there's a large deviation, and the statistical significance of that deviation is about 5.3 sigma. We can exclude a model uh, that does not have inflationary gravitational waves at 5.3 sigma, and the PTE is uh, very, very small. Also shown here in blue points is uh, one of these jackknife tests. So this is a difference test um, uh, done in time, and for historical reasons we decided we would show this one jackknife, although we have 14. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, in, 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 in this data set, which is designed to have zero signal, the uh, instrument is returning zero signal to within the noise. In fact, the fit here, the, the, the scatter in the data points looks almost uh, like it's too good. And I'll say a little bit more about that. <coughs> okay, here's, here's the full set of power spectra. Uh, so this is temperature, TE correlation, EE polarization. You can see the scales come down as you go from TT, these you know, huge scale, to TE, which is big, and EE, which is still pretty big compared to, to, to BB. Here's the BB spectrum I showed you before. And then you can do cross correlations between temperature and B-mode polarization and E-mode polarization and B-mode polarization. Uh, and, and these jackknives, you know, some, it's, it's got, they've got some statistical scatter. So you can see the probability to exceed for each of these jackknives. And so this is not a very, this is an unlucky choice. Um, these jacks here, the, the, the PTE looks very reasonable. Um, and, and so we, 
gone through all these difference tests to see um, if we have any indication of a systematic error. And as I mentioned, there are 14 of them. Um, <clears throat> we can chop up the data in different ways. So this, this first test here is showing a bore site rotation where we measure this guy in two rotation uh, choices and then repeat the observation in two different orientations and subtract them. And this, this jackknife is actually very good for us. This is one of our most powerful jackknives because we can probe for any effects, uh, slight mismatches in the beams. And we know that's a, a problem. It turns out that that kind of systematic is actually stronger in the, this jackknife than it is on the sky. So it's a great test of, uh, of, of that systematic. We can split the data up by time, left going, right going scans, or take our data from the first half of the observations and compare it with the second half. You can split up the detectors in groups and uh, probe for things like how the channels are grouped, uh, what tile they're on, whether they're on the inside or the outside of the focal plane, what readout channels are used to look for effects like that. You can also split up the data in, uh, in, 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 in ground fixed ways, uh, in, in, in azimuth, and this allows us to look for signals that might be fixed on the ground, like pickup from the ground or side lip response to the ground. And we also did a jackknife here with the moon when the moon's up or down to see if we see any contamination from the moon. Uh, and also we did jackknives for uh, bad sets of detectors with bad beam matching properties which leak temperature, this bright temperature signal into polarization. We can do that jackknife over the whole focal plane. And uh, so this is the distribution of all the jackknives. This is their probability, uh, sorry, the, this is the um, distribution of uh, chi-squared probability from zero to one. And there's no indication really of a, of, of a problem with these jackknives. Um, we, did, we did have one that's low, which is um, e, uh, an EE jackknife. I think it's the tile jackknife that was noted. Uh, and, and we believe that's a signal cancellation problem because the E-mode signal is so, is so bright. That's a very powerful test. <clears throat> In addition, uh, we have exquisite calibration measurements of all the properties of the instrument, polarization response, uh, beam response. Uh, and, and because we have a large beam instrument, this is something we have to worry about. Mismatches in the, the beam properties will leak temperature into polarization. And there's a whole family of them. The, there's a gain response between detectors and a pair. They can be offset, giving a kind of a differential pointing dipole-like effect. Uh, di differences in the width or differences in the ellipticity. And we developed a new technique to handle uh, these kinds of effects. What we do is we use a map, the map of the temperature anisotropies as a, a, a template, and we calculate what the map would look like for each of these leakage effects, and we determine the best fit parameter. And we can turn those on or off for each of these effects. What we actually do in the end is we deproject uh, differential gain and differential pointing uh, out of the data, and then we use measurements from the differential beam width and differential lipticity. Uh, because there is a price in this deprojection, and uh, that price is that uh, by turning on deprojection, you can also leak E mode polarization into B modes, and you get noise on that. Okay, so the, the green curve here shows what we have without deprojection. This is from measurements of all the beams. Turn on differential polarization, that's the blue curve. Gain, we come down here. And if we put in all of them, we get down to the black line. This is the residual from taking our completely measured beam maps and putting it through the, the pipeline. Um, so we, we, we made this choice of turning on two of them, but the, the overall effect is far below the signal level that we're reporting here. <coughs> Uh, we also investigated all the many systematic effects in the instrument that could give us uh, a false signal, and you see them here, and they're all very low. Either they're measurements of uh, these effects or, 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 or upper limits. And, and so we feel there's no explanation from instrumental systematics that are anywhere close to the signal we're seeing. <clears throat> now, one might worry about dust, uh, and well, the galaxy in general, but 
Uh, at our wavelength, two millimeters, 150 gigahertz, the biggest concern is, is dust. And when we started this investigation way back when, we thought that this clean region, the dust polarization signal should be very low. So we can calculate what the dust polarization is from various models. Uh, it's not extremely well measured and estimate what the level is. And so you see here in the dashed lines, um, the predicted um, contamination from galactic dust. And it's pretty small. Uh, since these models, there's been some data made public from the Planck collaboration um, in, in, in talks. And so we've estimated from those uh, public images how much polarization could be in our region. And you can see in the images, the polarization in our region is, is low, and of course the emission's low. So this is a, an estimate of, of how b bad polarization could be. We call them these DDM models. And then finally, we can take these models and cross-correlate them with our data. There's no indication of a cross-correlating signal. Those are the solid lines. Um, so uh, it, it appears that the, the, the dust is, is, uh, is low. We can also just visually look at the maps. And um, the template of the map is such that the dust should be picking up at the edges of the map. But when we look at the polarization pattern, it appears uniform. So just visually, it doesn't have the appearance of dust either. <coughs> Now, the first phase of this instrument now comes into play. Uh, what we did is BICEP-1 reported an upper limit in polarization of about 0.7. It wasn't as powerful of an instrument. But we can take the map that we measure from BICEP-2 and cross-correlate it with BICEP-1. And it turns out the noise statistics are more favorable when, when we do that. Um, and so in the cross-correlation, uh, we have a more powerful test of whether the signal we're seeing is real. And furthermore, BICEP-1 had two bands, 100 gigahertz and 150 gigahertz. So we can get some um, color information this way. OK, so here's the data. You can see uh, the, the solid points are the BICEP-2 points. And then the open points are crossed with BICEP-2 at 150 gigahertz, where the Xs are crossed with BICEP-1 at 100 gigahertz. Uh, and the, the combination here of 100 and 150 is about three sigma consistent with the, sorry, it's consistent with the BICEP2 signal and it's three sigma inconsistent with, uh, with no signal. So this is a nice confirmation of the signal we're seeing. And BICEP1 is a completely different instrument. The detection uh, methods are very, very different. Uh, the optics uh, are, are also actually quite different because of the feed horns. Um, so if there was any systematic error in the in BICEP2 measurement, you would not expect it to correlate with BICEP-1. <clears throat> and furthermore, the, the detection we have at 100 gigahertz in the cross-correlation allows us to spectrally constrain the, the index of the, the signal we're seeing. So um, Jeff made this calculation of uh, assuming that the signal we see is one component with a simple spectral index here. Uh, what, what are the data consistent with? And the, the, the curve you see here is a likelihood function uh, with a best fit beta of uh, minus 1.55. And that is consistent within one sigma of the spectrum of the microwave background. And furthermore, based on our best uh, information on the spectral index of dust and synchrotron, uh, these are way down in the likelihood function. And um, the data are inconsistent with emission from dust and synchrotron uh, at about 97% confidence. So this is, um, this is powerful evidence that the signal we're seeing is not from the galaxy. It's not completely conclusive. Uh, we would like to have higher statistical significance, but still, I think, very persuasive. <clears throat> so now, finally, we can take our data and we can cross-correlate BICEP2 with the Keck array. And, uh, so again, here the blue, sorry, the black data points are from um, BICEP2. The Xs are cross-correlating it with BICEP1. And now these are the total combined signal in the two colors in BICEP1. And once again, you can see BICEP1 and BICEP2 are consistent. BICEP1 cross BICEP2 is inconsistent with a signal that has no gravitational waves in it. <clears throat> and then uh, the blue points are crossing the BICEP2 uh, 
maps with the Kekere maps. And these Kekere maps are two years. They haven't come out in this release. So this is a preliminary analysis, but if one had, once again, uh, since they're um, independent measurements, this cross-correlation technique will uh, only show a correlation for, for things that are in common between these independent measurements. And uh, once again, you can see that the Keck points here are consistent with the inflationary polarization signal uh, at, this, at this amplitude uh, with bicep two. One can also note here that um, the black points with bicep two, people have pointed out that the fit here on these four points is quite good. The fit here at high L's is pretty poor. When we do a cross correlation with Keck, we're kind of rolling the dice again and we get a somewhat different answer. These points scatter down. Um, these points also scatter down, but the general picture is still consistent. Okay, so given the measurements of bicep two, we can uh, ask ourselves, what is the best fit tensor to scalar ratio? So the amplitude of the gravitational wave signal has been parameterized in the field by this number called R, which is the ratio of gravitational wave power to um, density wave power. <clears throat> and so here's our best fit measurement of R. It's 0.2 plus or minus uh, plus 0.07 minus 0.05. Now I should point out that when we measure R here, um, we have a, additional noise based on the size of the map that we're measuring. This is called um, sample variance. And so the statistical detection of R is weaker because of the number of modes in our map compared to the non-detection of R. So while we have a 5.3 non-detection of, or detect, you know, 5.3 discrepancy from a no R universe, uh, th these are our uh, numbers on R. Uh, we can also ask the question, how likely in this fit is a case where the tensor to scalar ratio is zero? And because of the model fitting, we get a statistical significance there of 7.0 sigma. Uh, now, maybe that this measurement of R is, is somewhat biased high because of uh, the contribution of foregrounds. And, and since we don't have as good a... Um, uh, estimate of foregrounds as we would like. Um, we just took these independent models and calculated what the uh, likelihood looks like on R. Um, and, you know, the, all of these models have uh, all these fits, these likelihoods, very strongly reject R of zero, but the best fit value scatters a bit depending on the contribution of dust. Uh, to take one example, if we believe the, um, the DDM2 model uh, is the best fit to, to, to the, the dust spectrum, in, in, in then we get an R value that comes down a bit. So it's possible that our R value was going to decrease a little bit, but once again, R of zero is very strongly disfavored. Uh, another thing I'm kind of, I think is cute, is, is that uh, we can actually detect the lensing signal itself up at, up at high L. And, and so this is a calculation here where, uh, up, up at high L, where we um, allow the, the lensing amplitude to, to float to be a free parameter. And this is then the likelihood uh, curves we get with uh, lensing amplitude and, and, and R. And uh, the, the amplitude of the lensing is consistent with uh, the value here that, that comes from Planck. Uh, so that's, that's kind of cute. It's about a... Uh, about a 2.7 sigma detection of lensing. Now it's been pointed out, or well we knew early on, that the, the level of, that, of, of signal we're getting is, is somewhat high. The Planck team came out with an upper limit of, of 0.11 uh, earlier, uh, about a year ago. And the um, <clears throat> question is, is you know, how can we be getting this value of 0.2? Is that, is that consistent with, with Planck? So one answer to that is that it may just be statistical. So if you look at these likelihood functions, especially if we put in dust, these likelihood functions do go down to 0.1. So it is possible that uh, the width of the likelihood function would uh, accommodate that possibility. <clears throat> Another possibility may be that our, um, our model of inflation isn't quite right. Now inflation can do more than one thing at a time. It can produce gravitational waves, uh, but it can produce other effects as well. 
And so the Planck team knew about this. So for example, the red curve here shows the likelihoods on R where uh, the data, um, you allow R to float, but you also allow uh, a running of the spectral index to float as well. And so then if you do that, the, the limits on R soften up. Instead of being 0.1, they soften up to um, higher than 0.3. So that's another possibility. If inflation did something like that, uh, the, our, our data combined with Planck would, would give you this uh, curve, and, and then the data sets would be consistent, although it would require additional parameter in uh, uh, in inflation, which would be very, very interesting. <clears throat> uh, it's also possible that, uh, you know, in this fitting process, perhaps using disjoint data from WMAP and, and uh, 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 other telescopes that perhaps there's, there's some problem there. And we look forward to working out the, the reason for this with the, uh, the rest of the CMB community. Okay. Uh, so this is my final slide. Uh, this was Andrew's favorite slide. And uh, since I was project straight man, it was my job to always wince whenever Andrew showed this slide. <laughs> and I'd never put it in any of my talks. <clears throat> but in conclusion, we're, we're looking for the CMB community to test our result. And I expect uh, in the next few months, we'll know the answer. And, and hopefully, they'll confirm it. Um, if uh, these results are confirmed, I would suggest that Andrew's slide here really is uh, accurate, and that the search for B modes is over. A new era of B mode cosmology has begun, and we've extended our view to the very first moments of the birth of the universe. stay in science for a little while, then you get like four or five times in your life, you get to be at a talk that you'll remember as one of the <laughs> ones that really changed the field. And so it's a, a great privilege to be here for this one. Uh, I will take my own privilege and ask the first question. So <laughs> if I look at your power spectrum and I, if I were worried about the excesses up where the lensing signal is, if I imagine I just move every point down by a little bit, I could both fit the lensing signal pretty well and fit a non-zero R, but maybe R is 0.1 or something like that. Is, is there any conceivable systematic that would make that happen? Well, um, I don't know of any systematic that would do that. But I should say that, uh, where's the best version? Looking, looking at the scatter in the, the power spectrum is a little bit uh, cherry-picking. Cherry so we um, we evaluated in the paper, we, we had set up the evaluations of probability well, in two categories. So the first was bins two through six up to here, and the second was bins two through nine, I believe, or is it two through 10? Um, <clears throat> and so we can ask for the whole data set, what's the probability to exceed? And so for the, for the whole data set, the probability is like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It's very normal. For the bins uh, two through six, I think it's about 0 0.9, which is also not so unusual. So given the whole data set, there's really no evidence for a problem. But of course, you can look and see deviations from particular points, but then you have a trials factor of doing that a posteriori. Great. Any other questions? I imagine they're probably not. People are too intimidated. Yes. OK, so if in a few months more experiments, and uh, I hope they confirm your results to be useful, but suppose R is 0.1, where would it have gone wrong? Are there systematic simulations? <laughs> I've slept pretty well these last few nights. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, just can you just from the exhaustion. For the yes, the question was, what happens if R were to go down to 0.1? Would something have gone wrong? <clears throat> uh, well, so one, one answer to that is this issue of sample variance. So we're, we're observing a particular patch of sky. The contributions, just the, random, the limited number of independent modes we see in that sky contribute a noise, OK? And so much of this histogram and the likelihood you see is from that sample variance. Somebody else goes off and measures a different patch of sky that can get a different, somewhat different number. Okay. And so you know, this tension with Planck, for example, uh, th this could, could possibly come down a little bit uh, because of the, that, that sample variance effect. 
And, and also, as I said, there is a small bias here from, from foregrounds. Yeah, Stanley? So if this breakthrough is tomorrow's calibration, what's, what are you going to see at the Keck level in 2015 could look for? Or so the question is, is, I guess, what would we be doing uh, next in 2014 and 2015? Uh, so an, on a short time scale, we've got two years of Keck, excellent Keck data that we haven't reduced. Okay, so for the next three months, we're going to be working hard on that, hopefully not more than three months. Uh, and then we have installed 95 gigahertz detectors in Keck this season. They've been on the sky for less than two weeks. But we're hoping on the time scale of several months, they'll accumulate enough sensitivity that we have a more powerful test of the color than, than, than we have currently with BICEP-1. Okay, so that's year one. <laughs> year, year two, I think, is if the signal holds up, uh, the amplitude's large, and so we're going to want to get as much cosmology as we can out of it. And, and that really means that we'll want to measure this signal over large regions of sky, get out all the available cosmology, because there's more to learn. Yes? Are there no scattering events from birth to death that would conceivably alter the polarization? Uh, can you repeat the scattering, scattering from what? From what? Birth to death, when the, the original oh. instant of inflation to when you see them, when you capture them in your building. Right, so the question is, is if there's um, other scattering events that could impart a polarization signal. Um, there, there is one that's known, which is uh, uh, basically the effect of this bump at very low L. That's uh, an effect from scattering that happens later in the universe when the universe is ionized more in, at, at, at late times. Uh, that effect isn't appreciable uh, in, in our band, however. Yep. So besides R, what else can you learn from the polarization? Well, so uh, one can uh, measure the tip of the spectrum. And there's a consistency test on the, 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 the index of the tensor modes. That's one example. I, th I, th I think that there are, you know, a, a scenario such as, uh, sorry, a scenario such as this with a running of the spectral index, I mean, that may, you know, that's a tantalizing possibility. That's another observable from inflation. We have to look at the whole data set, including Planck, to really get a, an effect like this, I think. But, but that is also a possibility that we could learn from inflation uh, in, in that way. That is, yes, so the, the, the question is, is that the BB consistency is uh, too consistent with zero. And that's shown here in the initial spectrum where the probability uh, in the jackknife, uh, in, in this particular jackknife that we've chosen is, is 0.99. That seems, that's, that's a very, too good, right? But you have to look at the total histogram of all the jackknives we've done. And when, when, when we do that, we don't see uh, a significant problem. And of course, all of these jackknives depend on the noise model. Yes? To, to get serious about confirmation, you're going to have your own data from Keck, but then the other experiment that's in play is Spider, of course, so assuming it's going to fly successfully. Can you remind us what this sensitivity is compared to this data set and whether one flight is going to start shedding light on it or they would have to fly for five years or what? Current sensitivity, of course, is, oh, sorry, the question is, is what, what could we learn with Spider to confirm this data? Um, of course, the sensitivity of Spider right now is zero because it hasn't <laughs> flown. <clears throat> and I, I wouldn't want to speculate what we're going to get in flight. Um, on the ground, with our best estimate, the sensitivity of Spider in its current configuration would be good enough to, 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 to do a consistency test, um, either in cross-correlation or by itself. Other questions? Yeah. With the additional data you anticipate uh, getting with Keck and putting that together with Planck data, can you say roughly how accurately you expect to be able to determine the spectral tilt for the tensor 
Yeah, so the question is, is given, given Keck data, how well can we determine the, the spectral tip? And um, I think the answer is not very well. And, and, and that's because our, our, our range in multipole is, is limited because of the size patch that we're looking at. So you know, th this is one of these things that to do a proper job, you really need to me measure it over the whole sky. Yeah. Would you say this increases or decreases the case for a dedicated satellite to look for polarization? <laughs> well, look, I mean, if the signal's there, we would be fools not to, to measure it to our to the best of our ability. I mean, this is a, a fabulous, fabulous uh, fossil relic, uh, Magna Carta of the, uh, sorry, not Magna Carta, Rosetta Stone. Stone. <laughs> <laughs> I think yes. that we're giving rights to a whole bunch of people as well. That's okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's two numbers on Ain't No R. Okay, so the, the question is, is which of these um, uh, probabilities should we quote for R? And they're really two different numbers. There's the 5.3 sigma uh, probability, which is testing against a model of the universe without R. And then the seven sigma number is if we allow a model of the universe with R, what's the probability <laughs> compared to R equals zero? So they're, 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 they're different numbers. I, I, would I would take that one, I, I guess. <laughs> Other questions? There you go. Presumably, there are hundreds of theories of inflation which would make different predictions about all the parameters you're talking about. Do you expect with the level of this experiment and some of the refinements we've been talking about to be able to exclude large numbers of those theories, or is it do you feel still wide open? Well, uh, I think the answer is that, uh, sorry, so the question is, is what, what models of inflation can we include or exclude? And um, this detection excludes many models of inflation. And um, Sean can probably tell you more, but theorists I have talked to would say that it excludes more models than it includes. You, you yeah, a, this is a huge surprise. I lost $100 mm -hmm. because you guys <laughs> found this. <laughs> so this excludes a lot of models of inflation and a whole lot more of non-inflation models. And of course, that inspires yet new ideas. So the total number of models remains fixed. <laughs> <laughs> but it will be a different set of models. Did you Other? Oh, uh, yeah, we can uh, ask him. <laughs> Other questions? All right, I think we should thank uh, both Jamie and the whole Bicep2 team for doing such an amazing job. <laughs>